I have a group of friends who have been close since kindergarten. There's four of us, which means me and three more guys. We were 28 through 29 at the time this event happened. We are all really close, even though ever since college, we meet up very rarely. All of us were on long-lasting and steady relationships, either married or the modern equivalent, except for the main subject of this story, who had just come out of a pretty messy divorce. This friend, named Andy, had been having a really rough time as his wife decided to leave him right as his mother was dying of cancer, so it was understandable that we were all a bit worried about him. So, one of my friends has a pretty nice country house that's away from civilization enough to allow for a nice weekend retreat every once in a while. And at the start of this story, we had one of those scheduled. The week before, as we were all planning our retreat, Andy decided that he wasn't going because he didn't want to be the only one without a significant other for the entire weekend. We all insisted a bit, but we kinda understood the feeling, and since he had another event to go to during the weekend, we left it alone. Still, I wasn't really satisfied with that, as I felt he really could use the change of scenery. So I decided that I'd give him a call Saturday morning right before I left to the country house, offer him a ride, and give him one last chance to show up. I called him from the door of my house, and he sounded kind of weird on the phone, like he was sluggish or something. I even joked with him about it, since it was kind of early in the morning and I assumed I had woken him up. He didn't laugh or anything, so I thought he was pissed. When I offered to pick him up and give him a ride, he simply replied, Okay. I told him to pack up a change of clothes and meet me in front of his house. It was me, the wife, and him in the car for a nice 45-minute drive. I started noticing things were off just as he got into the car. He was acting really stupid. I have no other way to put this. He didn't get any jokes, had trouble understanding simple questions, and kept replying either with a simple yes or no, or with a really slurred short phrase at the most. At this point, me and the wife all had reason to be worried about him. We started thinking maybe he'd developed some weird form of depression or started doing drugs. He refused to acknowledge anything was wrong with him, and so we simply drove on, hoping maybe he'd open up later. So, finally, we all arrived. We were all friends for over 20 years, so lots of fun were to be had. It quickly became obvious to all of us that Andy wasn't acting right. He wasn't playing any games, wasn't talking at all, spending most of the time just looking at us or at the outside. He'd have a look of marvel on his face as if he was watching something really impressive unfolding. As time went on, I noticed he wasn't eating or drinking anything at all, and one of the guys swears that he kept tabs and Andy never went to the bathroom at all for the entire stay. We tried to get him to talk, but he'd just give the same exact response every time. I'm okay. He ended up winning the patience game, and we just left him to his own devices. The night went on. He sat on a bench outside looking at a stretch of woods near the house. We stayed indoors talking and stuff, and then we decided to sleep. Andy said he'd go soon, he just wanted to chill outside for a bit, and we all let him be. Late the next morning, his bed was still made. He was sitting outside in the exact same place we left him, in the exact same position. That was it. I completely freaked out and decided it was time to go back home. We packed our stuff and said our goodbyes. Everyone was really worried about him, but we all felt creeped out, so we just called it a weekend and left. I drove him home, dropped him off, and went home myself. Later that night, we ended up all meeting each other again in a restaurant for a birthday get-together of a common friend. I noticed Andy was himself again, and my two other friends looked really puzzled. So I sat down and asked him, What the f happened yesterday, man? He replied with something like, Yeah, my car broke down and Peter here had to pick me up in the middle of the night after the bar. Well, that made no sense, so we all started asking questions and trying to puzzle it all back. Turns out he was at the bar with a couple of the other guys at the same time he was with us at the country house. 
When we kept insisting in a kind of panic that that was impossible, multiple people showed us pictures of him at said event. There were fucking pictures. So we all freaked out, and noticing that we weren't joking, Andy freaked out as well. We confirmed via phone history that his phone in fact got my call Saturday morning, but he doesn't remember answering it. After this, the talk did continue, but we really couldn't get anywhere, and that was it. As the months passed by, the three of us all got really afraid of Andy and who he could be. We still have no idea who was with us at the house, and Andy has gotten really sick of hearing about this, to the point of getting real mad when the subject comes up. He says the most rational explanation is that we all got confused and thought this whole thing up. I'm still nervous about it to this day, especially because I dropped him off at his house and saw him enter. Where the f did fake Andy go to? Did he do anything while we were all asleep? Now this one is extremely mind-boggling. How do you explain a person being in two separate locations at the same exact time and you also have evidence of them being in both locations at the same time? On one hand, you literally have multiple people saying he went on this trip, and on the other, there's literally photographic evidence of him not being there, not to mention that's his own memory of the situation. The only ounce of explanation I can come up with is that one of them wasn't Andy. This took place last year at the beginning of summer. I was with my mom headed down to my Nana's farm to visit for a weekend. For some context, she lives on a farm way back in the country, right at the foot of a mountain in South Carolina. It's a very rural, secluded area, so the roads are badly maintained and barely wide enough for two cars to pass one another. The houses are also spread out and set far back into the tree line from the road, so there's very little ambient light besides the headlights of a car. So my mom and I are driving along, her in the driver's seat and me in the passenger. It was about 11 p.m. and we're maybe 15 minutes out from Nana's, deep in the woods with the radio down almost to silent. We come onto this straight stretch of road in a heavily wooded area. Suddenly, this blur of a creature darts out across the road, right at the edge of our headlights. It was moving pretty fast, but both my mom and I were able to get a good look at it and both agree on what we saw. It was a fairly large creature, roughly the size of a person, maybe bigger. Neither of us could make out the head, but we both remember it appearing to have a segmented body as if it were emaciated and its ribcage was poking out. It had long limbs, and as it moved across the road, it didn't run the way a dog or a horse would with all four legs. The best word to describe it would be limping, using its front limbs to pull itself along. It was moving considerably fast. We both said something along the lines of, what the hell is that, as it crossed in front of us. As we got up to where it had crossed, I turned to look at it just as it reached the other side of the road and out of our headlights. I swear on my life, it stood up and ran, not like a dog rearing on its hind legs, it was definitely bipedal, running on only two limbs. I immediately yelled that it had stood up, and we both started getting nervous. I honestly would have thought I was going insane had I not had another person in the car with me. My mom has always been a pretty level-headed person and not superstitious, but she was very nervous and made me agree to not tell my Nana about it to avoid scaring her, which made me recognize how serious this was. I should also mention that there had apparently been a series of attacks on livestock and horses in the area around the time this happened. People were saying they found wire fences ripped through and their animals attacked. There had been a few other strange incidents in the area, but that was my personal experience. I used to work on the north slope of Alaska in the oil industry. The work we were doing required us to travel far out into the Alaska Petroleum Reserve, which is basically just untamed tundra wilderness for hundreds of miles. The oil companies would build these long ice roads in the winter that would lead to exploration drilling pads. 
Our job was to go out after they finished the initial drilling and test rock formations for their oil producing qualities. It was mid-January, the sun hadn't quite come up yet, and when I say the sun hadn't come up, I mean in almost a month and a half. Polar nights are intense. The particular well site we were traveling to was about 60 miles west of Alpine, Alaska, deep in the wilderness. Our job took a week, but we finished and were headed back to camp to finish our hitch and go home. At the beginning and end of the ice roads are guard shacks that you have to check in and out of for safety. There's no cell reception or radio up to a certain distance. If you don't check in or out in a set time, they come looking for you to ensure you're not a popsicle. It was about four in the morning, not that it mattered in the land of endless night, and we were halfway across the ice road. Travel was slow as the speed limit on the roads is only 25 miles an hour. When something appeared on the road in our headlights. It was a man in jeans, sneakers, and a hoodie jacket. Walking down the ice road in Wilderness Tundra at 4 a.m. and it was negative 20 degrees outside. It's not unusual for the local Inuit people to be out this far hunting. Maybe his snowmobile broke down and he's trying to get back to the guard shack? It seemed plausible. He didn't acknowledge us as our trucks rolled up next to him, he just kept shuffling forward. He didn't seem cold, his clothing, while totally not appropriate for this extreme weather, appeared warm and dry. We also noticed he wasn't Inuit, but Caucasian. I rolled down my window and asked if he needed any help and if he was okay. He still didn't acknowledge us, just kept shuffling forward. His face was completely blank, devoid of any thought or emotion. The other guys in my truck suggested that maybe he was in an accident and in shock. I continued rolling my truck alongside him as he trudged down the road, still trying to get his attention. Even in this extreme cold, I could occasionally get whiffs of a peculiar smell coming off him. He smelled… acidic, if that makes sense. There's just a lot about this guy that made the hair on my neck stand up. The guy behind me in the truck's crew cab had had enough of all this. He rolled down his window and reached out to grab the guy. He later would say that he was just trying to shake him out of his stupor. Before his hand could reach him though, this walking popsicle spun around and latched onto my buddy's outstretched arm. He glared at him and then at me with this look of pure rage, not removing his hand from his arm. If emotions had a physical temperature, this guy could have melted the entire tundra that night. My buddy groaned in pain as he tried to get his arm free from Mr. Popsicle. At that moment, this guy starts screaming in our faces. There was so much hate and rage and anger in that scream. It was absolutely terrifying. I slammed on the gas and spun out on the ice for a second before the wheels caught and launched us forward. Popsicle dude still had a hold of my buddy's arm and was trying to pull him out of the truck. He was running alongside us while the other guys in the cab held on to keep him inside. Eventually, he tore free from this guy, and we hauled ass to the guard shack another 30 miles down the road. We checked in with the guards and reported what we had just seen. The guard was looking at us like we were pulling a prank, but policy said that they had to check it out regardless. My buddy's arm was sore, and when he pulled back his sleeve, there were noticeable bruises in the shape of a hand around his arm. We filed a report with the guard and were told to head back to our camp. None of us really wanted to talk about what happened, and it was a quiet drive the rest of the way. We flew home the next day. We later ran into the guard at the shack, and we asked him if they ever saw the guy on his patrols. He told us they searched up and down that ice road for a solid 12 hour shift, and saw nothing, not even tracks in the snow leading off the road. He told us it was a good prank and that he'd get us back for making him waste a shift driving around. Now, I just want to stress a couple of different things here. If you couldn't already tell, this is an extremely harsh climate to be in. This is deep in the Alaskan wilderness, negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit outside, almost two months into polar night, and it's like four o'clock in the morning. With that being said, try to explain why there's somebody out there in sneakers, jeans, and a hoodie, because I f 
fucking cat. After I graduated last May, I decided to take up a job at my local jail. Nothing long term, just figured I'd work a year and save up some cash before college. The time was a little after 5am, and I was sitting behind my desk, absolutely bored to tears. So, being a good little deputy, I was spinning around in my chair, honestly trying not to fall asleep. This was hour 11 of a 12 hour shift, so I'm just killing time before I get to go home. Now, to give you a little visual of where I am, I'm in a giant room with a bunch of cells. At one end of the room is the officer's desk with big windows behind it. These windows are super reflective, so officers can look inside from the hallway, but inmates can't look outside into the hallway. Anyways, I'm spinning around in my chair and happen to glance up at the reflective windows behind the desk. As I do, some movement catches my eye upstairs. There's someone walking around up there, out of their cell. I stare in disbelief for a moment, and instantly freak the fuck out. I quickly turn around to see no one up there. I scramble and check the monitor that gives me controls of the cell doors and make sure all of them are locked, which they are. I even go up there myself and make sure everything is secure as can be. Somewhere in the middle of me making sure I'm not about to get fired, it dawned on me. That was a motherfucking ghost. There was no mistaking it. I 1000% saw someone up there. Now, I don't mean I saw a quick little shadow or a suspicious looking speck of dust. No, I was distinctly looking at someone in an orange jumpsuit walking around up there. I could tell you this guy's haircut, his height, build, and even what kind of beard he had. I immediately get my corporal on the horn and tell her excitedly that I saw a ghost. But things don't end there. After that, I was bragging to anyone and everyone about my little encounter with some mixed reactions. My sergeant says he doesn't really believe in ghosts. But some deputies told me they've definitely seen some paranormal stuff on duty too. However, it's what the sergeant on day shift shared that has really stuck with me. He told me that they had an inmate commit in that same pod a few years prior. I gave a description of the guy I saw, and we decided to look up the inmate just to see if they looked the same. It was him. It was definitely the guy I saw walking around upstairs, right down to his skinny face and the billy goat beard. There was no mistaking it. I've talked to some inmates about it, and I've had more than one tell me that sometimes they can see or hear someone walk by their cells, peeking in at the late hours of the night. It can't be a correctional officer they're talking about, because they're always wearing an orange jumpsuit. My husband recently took an overnight job to help us out during COVID. He's only been there about two weeks and works evenings and overnights, 9pm to 6am. Last night was no different, he left home around 8.15pm. Our daughter, age 11, and I decided to make it a movie night. Around 11pm, I heard keys in my back door and the usual sounds my husband makes when he comes home. I creep out to the kitchen to make sure it was him, and it was. He told me he needed to grab his knee compression sleeve, walks down the hall, says hi to our daughter as he passes the living room, and goes upstairs. He came back down, gave me a kiss, and left again. We finished our movie and went to bed. In the morning when he got home, I made a joking comment about him forgetting his knee sleeve. He was genuinely confused as I recalled the previous night. Our daughter confirmed everything I said, and he still was acting confused. I pulled up our security motion camera on my phone to show him when he popped in quick. But there was no footage from the night before or any other night of him coming home after he's left for work. My daughter and I both heard him, saw him, and I even touched him. But apparently he was never home during that time. Nothing else out of the ordinary happened that night. We seriously have 
no idea what happened. This one is similar to the story about Andy from earlier. It involves multiple people interacting with somebody who apparently was never there. It's very strange to realize how common of an occurrence this is. I honestly had no idea until I started covering them on the channel. People have thrown out multiple explanations for these kinds of stories, ranging from the infamous Navajo skinwalker to just some sort of wrinkle in time. Again, although the mother and daughter interacted with him, neither the father nor the security camera footage back up their memories. This happened to me back in the winter of 2003 when I was 16 years old. It is by far the weirdest thing that has ever happened to me that I still don't have an explanation for. It was a dreary winter afternoon. All the trees are bare and it's gray and gross looking outside. There is no snow on the ground. My boyfriend and I were leaving the house to go somewhere and before I got into his car, I realized that I forgot something inside. I handed him my purse and asked him to put it in his car. It was a bright blue purse. I had basically my whole life in there. My wallet and all my money, my Nextel phone, my makeup, literally everything that was important to 16 year old me. I come back to the car, we get in and we go. A few minutes later, I say, hey, you put my purse in here, right? Yeah, it's in the back, he said. I turn and look and see it partially covered up by some clothes. A few minutes later, I turn to get it, and it's not there. I am looking everywhere. Eventually, I tell him to pull over. The purse isn't in here. So we pull over and tear the car apart. It's not there. I'm upset and asking, why didn't you put it in the car? He of course is upset too, and swears he did. I concede that... I saw it in the back, too. We go back to my house, figuring it must have fallen out. We get back and start searching, everywhere, in the driveway, the road, my front yard. My house wasn't very big, so there weren't many places it could be. At some point, my dad comes out from all the commotion and starts to look, too. We literally looked everywhere, and it's nowhere to be found. After about 10 minutes of looking, I start to give up. I was very upset thinking how I'll never be able to replace my phone, all my money, and everything else in there. I sit down in my driveway, and then... The weirdest feeling comes over me. I can only describe it as a feeling of warmth and total calm. I look up, and the purse materializes right in front of my eyes. It literally just appeared right in front of me on our rock ledge. I say out loud, oh, there it is, and very calmly and almost trance-like walk over to it. My dad and boyfriend are just shocked because it wasn't there a minute before. My dad was standing right there. Everything is in the purse. Nothing is out of sorts, no marks, no dirt to indicate it fell off the car or anything. The weirdest detail is that there is no way three people missed a bright blue purse in the middle of winter with no snow and no sun. It would have instantly stuck out against the backdrop of the day. I even remember seeing it in his car. No people walked by as we were looking, our neighbors weren't home, just no explanation for how it appeared in front of my eyes. It was almost like I willed it back to me. My boyfriend refused to discuss how the purse magically appeared after that. He was really freaked out and just kept saying how positive he was that he put the purse in his car. Now, my first thought here was that the boyfriend probably just left it on the rock and thought that he put it in the car, right? If that's what happened though, how do you explain the girlfriend also seeing this bright blue purse sitting in the back before it just completely disappeared? Again, that's right where the boyfriend says he put it, so how did it end up on that rock back at the house? Last summer, the summer of 2022, my brother and I swapped rooms. He likes to sleep in warmer conditions, and I like colder. His room is colder and mine is warmer, so we agreed to switch for the night. 
Sometime during the night, I think it was around 4 a.m., I woke up and saw my 10-year-old sister at the foot of the bed. I asked her what she was doing and was met with no response. I told her I was going to get water and she moved over to the desk. I walk out the door, turn into the living room, and my sister is laying on the couch, sleeping. I turn back into the bedroom, and she's no longer standing by the desk. Due to the room layout, there is no way she could have run past me and laid down on the couch before I saw her. I've already ruled out sleep paralysis as I walked around and then went back to bed. I worked in the funeral industry for six years. Most of my experience has been what they call a removal tech. Basically, I go and pick up the bodies from hospitals, facilities, homes, etc. and bring them back to the care center where I log them into storage. I received a call for a residential home in the area. The deceased was a woman in her late 50s. I arrived at the home and spoke to the daughter and son. The deceased had died in the back bedroom and had fallen against the door. The woman was fairly obese, 320 pounds, and the fire department had to break the door to the bedroom down to get to her. After assessing the situation and going over paperwork with the family, I explained that we would not be able to get the gurney into the room. Small hallways and tight corners are a nightmare for us in this industry. I explained that I would have to set the gurney up in the living room and bring the deceased out to it. I advised the family to step outside while me and my partner moved the body. It was a typical day at work so far. We got a sheet under the body and drugged her out into the living room. I had set up the gurney in the middle of the room and right above us was a chandelier. We lifted her up and onto the gurney. The moment she was square on the gurney, the light bulb went out above us. Me and my partner just looked at each other. I had a sense that this was some sort of communication. Almost like this woman was watching us and screamed out when we placed her body on the gurney, seeing and accepting the fact that she was dead. My partner and I drove back to the care center and logged in the case without anything else happening. We both were stunned and had no explanation for the light. A month later, I was visiting some friends and told them the story. We were all sitting outside having drinks, and when I got to the part about the light going out, I snapped my finger accentuating how the exact moment she was on the gurney, it had burst. Guys, when I snapped my finger, all the little plastic lawn lights went out. I honestly couldn't believe it. Out of the thousands of bodies I've picked up in crazy situations I've been in, I've never had anything like this happen before. Just makes you wonder what's really out there. Back in 2021, my family took a trip to Lake Sainitla in North Carolina. A beautiful lake that's rich in Native American history and surrounded by mountain trails. We decided to go on one of these trails on an overcast day. I am not an athletic person and suffer from asthma, so I was behind the rest of my family by myself. About maybe halfway through the hike, I heard my sister yell my birth name, but it sounded like it was off the trail. She never calls me by my real name, just my nickname that I've had since I was a baby. It sounded like she was scared, so I was very tempted to run off and find her, but I knew my sister wasn't stupid. She wouldn't go off the trail, even in case of an emergency. I quickly caught up to the rest of my family, and my sister was there with them, resting on some rocks next to a waterfall, chatting away and taking pictures. I asked my sister if she had called my name. She didn't know what I was talking about. She had been talking to our dad the whole time. I don't know what called my name that day, but I'm glad I didn't listen to it. My eldest son was deaf until he was nearly three due to an inner ear malformation. He talked a little, but was very hard to understand. During the time of this story, his father, my now ex-husband, was in basic training. So it was just me and my son. 
At night, I would hear him talking in his room, adjoining mine, but couldn't understand what he was saying. He laughed occasionally, though, so it's all good. For Christmas that year, my mom made me and my sisters memory books. She copied photographs of her and my dad's family for us. Until this point, I had no pictures of my grandparents. So a few days past Christmas, I'm showing my sister-in-law the memory book. I have my son on my lap and the book on my knees. I turned to a page that had group photos of my great-grandparents and grandparents. My son's face lights up and he points at my mom's father, Robert, in a group photo and says, clear as anything, that's Bob. Me and my sister-in-law glance at each other. I asked, how do you know him? My son giggles and says, night-night. The thing is, even if I had had a photo of my grandfather, I never called him Bob. He was just Grandpa. The other one was Grandpa George. So there's literally no way my son could have known his name and pointed him out in a group photo. Now I love hearing these stories about kids seeming to be in touch with things beyond our comprehension. Now, with that being said, though, let's be sure to stay skeptical here. Um, I can definitely see how somebody might have shown this kid a picture of Bob, and maybe he just remembered it, and that's how he pointed it out. However, that's a pretty specific scenario, and I'm not sure how long a three-year-old would remember something like that. It sounds like he had a pretty deep recognition of this person, judging by the mother's account of how his face just immediately lit up when he saw it. Recurring viewers will know that this is not an isolated occurrence. There are many different cases of children who just somehow have this impossible knowledge. My friend, I'll call them Blake, has a younger brother. This younger brother was supposed to be a twin, but sadly it never happened. The other twin passed away and it was stillborn. Ever since Blake's little brother has been walking age, their family has talked about the other one. A kid that looks just like their brother who will walk into rooms, but when their parents call after him, he won't respond, and when they follow him, he's not there. The other one has grown with Blake's little brother, and there are even nights when I'll be staying at their house, and their mom comes in the room and asks us something like, did one of y'all go outside? And neither of us had been out all night. I technically wasn't home alone. My two kids, about four and six, were also home, but asleep. My then-husband was in the Air Force and worked nights. He was very unpredictable and had a really violent temper, so a lot of my life at this time involved eggshell walking. One morning, I was awoken by sounds in the kitchen. I have really poor vision. I heard the noise, jumped out of bed, and went to the hall. I thought it was my younger son. He was a troublemaker. So with my very fuzzy vision, I looked towards the kitchen where the noise came from. I see what looks like a man in uniform standing in front of the rack I used as a pantry. I immediately assume it's my husband. I say, hey, guess I slept in. You hungry? I ask because it looks like he's picked something up off the rack. So he turns and moves farther into the kitchen where I can't see. I figure it's my husband being his normal moody-ass self, so I sigh, get my glasses from the nightstand, and walk down to the kitchen. Nothing. Nobody there. He couldn't have left because our door squeaked and I would have heard it. It had only been like 60 seconds max. It wasn't a big house, and when I looked out, only my car was in the driveway. The weirdest part that prevents me from writing it off as a hallucination is there was a box of Annie's mac and cheese on the floor in front of the rack. I actually put it back where it belonged and then gently tipped it to see where it landed, and it wasn't anywhere near where I found it. 